Welcome to Second Take, the show that focuses on the issues behind the news. There has been some notable progress on the renewable energy front over the past week, and joining me to discuss developments are Christy van der Merwe and Terence Kremer. Christy and Terence, welcome to Second Take. Terence, if I could start with you, could you shed some light on the moves that have been made by government this week to begin facilitating investment into renewable energy? Yes, we've been in a bit of a quagmire period, both legislatively, policy-wise, uh, as uh, regulatory wise as well as contractually we, uh, you know people haven't really been able to do any of these renewable energy projects and I think this week we've seen some of the stepping stones being put in place to get out of this quagmire that we've been in and the first thing came out in the, the Sunday newspapers we saw an advert for the transaction advisor for a what could be a competitive bidding process for renewable energy projects as well as cogeneration projects so that advert for a transaction advisor is sort of kickstart a process of designing a competitive bidding process for renewable energy and cogeneration projects. And we should have a selection of that transaction advisor quite soon, probably during October, and that the, the, the bidding process could actually start as early as November. And subsequent to that, we had the request for information to renewable energy project developers themselves to try and uh, tease out the state of readiness of the projects that people have been working on for quite some time now. And there's been this delay in the process contractually, legislatively, legally, uh, as well as uh, we haven't known who is going to be the buyer of this first power. So we know the integrated resource plan, the first version, which was very highly criticized, sets aside 1,025 megawatts of renewable energy by 2013. And money has been set aside in the multi-year uh, price determination, the second version of that, for Eskom to buy that power. We, and we also know that the, 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 the RP1 sort of sets aside the quotas for wind, solar. I think it's 400 megawatts for wind, uh, 320 for solar and 300 from others to be brought into the system uh, by 2013. But we have had this delay and uh, uh, there's, they've had to be put in uh, a process uh, to try get us out of this no man's land that we've been in. And I think this week we saw the beginnings of that. Christy, there was also a significant wind seminar in Gauteng, which you attended. Could you take us through some of the highlights from the seminar? Sure. The one thing that stood out was that the wind developers, who there seem to be quite a few of, um, are very excited about what Terence was just talking about, the request for information and the transaction advisors. They know who they're going to be selling the power to, so they're very, very excited about this. We've been waiting for it for a while now. Um, we also had someone from Eskom telling us that they have received applications for or requests for grid connection from renewable energy developers to for about 15,000 megawatts of power, which is really quite a lot, I think, more than they were ever expecting. And of that, more than 13,000 megawatts is wind. So the wind developers have been very busy in the meantime. They've been um, acquiring land, doing EIAs, feasibility studies, all those kinds of things, so that when they are able to sell the power, they can do so, they can start these projects up quickly. Um, the other portion of the conference, the focus was on local manufacture. Um, the Minister of Energy, Mrs. Peters, addressed us, and um, she said that we must have a certain percentage of local manufacturers. It's a very important thing for job creation, so they're really pushing that. And we heard from um, two, two companies that are already doing local manufacture. They're small turbine manufacturers, Kestrel and Palm Tree Power. So they're already starting to do it. They've got facilities, they're creating jobs, they're making these turbines, so we can do it. We do have the capacity, we have the, the skills for you know, steelwork and uh, fiberglass, so we can do those kinds of things here. Um, yeah, so all in all, I think the, the wind developers are very excited now. Chrissy, there was also the release of the wind measurement package of the South African Wind Atlas project. Why is this significant? It's another good thing. It's not uh, something that's vital that the wind developers were waiting for. It wasn't holding them back in any way because a lot of them have put in their own money to do their own measurements. Why this is important is that it's freely available to everyone. So the Department of Energy with a number of um, funders, particularly the Danish Embassy, they have 
established 10 measurement masts throughout the country, um, Western, Northern and Eastern Cape. So they're measuring sites there and you can actually access it on the website. It's, it's pretty cool to actually go and look at it. You can see the wind speeds and all sorts of interesting information there. So it's available to everyone. So the smaller developers who might not have the money to pump into those f pretty expensive studies can go and have a look at that. You can see you know, how the wind is blowing across the country. Um, it's, it's important to have this accurate and immediate data available, I think, to everyone. And also, after about a year of measuring, they will analyze this data and collect it, put it all together, and then we will have the wind atlas. This is the idea anyway. And Terence, finally, the concept of a solar park was also in the news this week. How will this initiative fit into South Africa's renewable energy aspirations? Well, that's going to be interesting to see. I think uh, what we're hearing from Christie as well, there's a lot of demand uh, out there to supply renewable energy for, uh, through the reefer tariffs. There's the wind guys, there's the solar guys, there's mini hydro, and there's, there's many uh, projects sort of on the horizon. I think. Uh, as someone once described it to me, sort of hovering above the airport but with no landing rights yet. But I think we're getting to the point where we're getting landing rights and there, there, there are still a lot of uncertainties. I think we need the integrated resource plan, the second version, to come out. And they are promising that this will be published in the next couple of weeks and that we will have that promulgated uh, by November. And that will give us some sort of a roadmap for the generation mix going ahead for the next 20, 25 years. So we do need that. We also need to standardize the power purchase agreement. And I think by all accounts that we're very close. Uh, I think we're getting the impression there isn't going to be a, a government guarantee, but there's going to be some letter of commitment behind that from the National Treasury. And developers seem to be able to say that they can live with that. So projects are going to be bankable. So there are going to be a lot of projects and we need that integrated resource plan to, to give us some idea, as well as how long the longevity of the refit program. I think already there's a lot of uh, sort of disquiet within government about the, the level of tariffs being offered uh, across the board. They're saying there have been technology developments, especially solar PV, concentrated solar PV. Does it really need nearly four rand a kilowatt hour? And can we sustain those sort of rates? So I think just, just adding to the context, I think there's still, there are still some loose ends, but we are seeing progress. And then coming to the solar park is that, again, a very big, audacious uh, project, very high aspirations, a 5,000 megawatt uh, park up in the Uppington area, uh, where we would probably need to spend, uh, well, the developers would need to spend about 150 billion rand over the next 10 years to bring all that capacity in. And that would be a technology neutral park and uh, that would mean we'd have solar thermal, which could pr pr potentially provide base load power, and we'd have uh, concentrated PV, different type of PV technologies coming in there that would probably provide sort of peaking output, given that you have th there aren't really any storage solutions uh, you know, immediately available for the, for the PV technology. So a very big, uh, big project. Uh, I'm not too sure how it's, what it's going to mean for refit type solar projects outside of that park, whether it's going to displace them and there could be some unhappiness on the horizon around that. But I think what some of the clarity will come up at the, an investor conference on the 28th and 29th of October in Uppington. They're going to have the top 20 uh, developers and technology providers have been invited. They've, they've invited more than that, but they're wanting to get the world's best in solar at that conference. And they have sent out the invitation. I think they were sent out on Tuesday and they will uh, be getting those invites soon. That should give us some certainty about what that project uh, entails, whether there's investor appetite and the pricing of that, because they're saying it's never going to be a refit type pricing. We're going to have to be competitive with coal and nuclear. Terence, thank you very much. And also to you, Christy, thank you for joining us on Second Take. That is the Second Take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.